Welcome to Triangle BNI. Today's show is brought to you by Oak City Tech. Folks, the digital world is crowd and loud, and you need somebody like the Oak City Tech professionals to help you get through this so you can get your correct message to the correct people so you can grow your business. Go to oakcitytech.com. Tell them what you're looking for. I know they'll be able to help you. Hi, everybody. My name is Mike Manning. Each week on Triangle BNI, we bring you a small business success story. If you're not familiar with BNI, it is Business Networking International, the world's largest networking organization. Our little slice of heaven here in the Triangle is Raleigh, Durham, and Chapel Hill. And each week, about 33 chapters and almost 550 members get together. And our goal is to help each other grow our businesses. And our small business success story this week is Michelle Castle with Prosperity Partner. Michelle is also in RD27, Bull City Business Leaders. They meet Thursday mornings at 1115 at Cafe Parizade when it's in person. Right now, it's still Zoom. Michelle, glad to have you on the show today. How are you? I am fantastic. Glad to be here. Thank you. And Michelle is also a consulting director like myself, which means we help other chapters and uh, we love giving. And I know you enjoy that aha moment when you help a chapter or an individual. Uh, it's kind of nice, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I'm actually the founding consulting director of RD26. So that's good. And you take all credit for every bit of success they have, right? Oh, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> No, we're, we've got a really good team and, and um, you know, but, but I do think the consulting director, when you're finding, founding a group, I think there's a certain role that's unique. You really get to keep on casting the vision of what's possible and what we're up to and, you know, not taking no for an answer. Like we're not tire kicking. We're not giving it a shot. We're like doing this. And I do think that makes a difference. I agree. And our, that group meets in Wake Forest on Thursday mornings. Nope. It, it meets at Parazad whenever we have Parazad. Oh, that's why. Right. Yeah, it's Tuesdays. We're basically going to duplicate I, the success I, of our 27. Yeah, and I keep on to connecting. I keep on to connect you to that wake, that new Wake Forest chapter. That's what I thought yeah. it was. Anyway. Yeah, I do work with uh, Toby on that one. Okay, so good. All right. I, I knew there was a connection to Toby yeah, and Wake yeah. Forest. Didn't know how. All right, so let me unpack everything you do. All right, so help me with this. So here's what I got and just tell me where I'm going right, going wrong. You are a certified holistic health coach. I am. All right. So you help people find a clear path to get what they want physically, emotionally, spiritually, interpersonally, and financially. That's true. How did that come about? Well, I love that question. Uh, what I always say to people, you know, don't, uh, I don't go to broke financial planners or overweight personal trainers. And I think that, you know, seeking out mentors has been one of my key to successes in life. And so when um, I got to say those things that I can help people with, they are things that I have conquered in my own life. You know, I mean, it's always a journey. It's not like you ever arrive at a destination, but I definitely went in each one of those areas from being pretty darn miserable and feeling like really out of control. You know, things were just happening to me and I didn't, really know, you know, how I could make it different. And um, so I really um, dug into a lot of personal development. I went to divinity school, studied theology um, to get my spiritual questions at least validated so I didn't feel crazy. And uh, just, you know, I spent thousands of hours on personal development, lots of mentorship, read, you know, thousands of books. And uh, so I love to share with people um, from my own experience as well as listening to their experience and helping them make sense of things. Um, I think one of the biggest things that I notice with people is that they don't know that they can choose to have things be different. You know, not to say you can do it overnight, but I think people underestimate what you can get done in, in, in a year, in five years, in 10 years, you know? And when you were looking at your personal situation, which one of those did you address first and why? Great question. Um, for me, it was the spiritual uh, because uh, my mom was a nun, just like, you know, I'm just the average Chinese Jamaican <laughs> daughter of a nun, you know, Pentecostal minister kind of a gal. So um, spirituality was really important in the household that I grew up in. And, um, and I, I think I was raised in like the best that the Catholic church has to offer. It was very uh, warm, spiritual. You know, we did a lot of community service, a lot of Bible study, 
um, prayer meetings and stuff like that. Not, you know, great music, praise and worship and, and just un, not your traditional uh, Catholic upbringing. So, um, you know, I had, I had that. And then my parents got divorced uh, my senior year of high school and, or they got separated then. And a lot of what they said was going on was around spirituality. And then my dad went off and became a Pentecostal minister. And so it was just, and I, you know, he would say things about the Catholic church and, and I would be like, I don't know. And, you know, he'd quote the Bible and then my mom would say that was nonsense. And I, there was just a lot going on and I couldn't, you know, and to me, it's like, are we sinners in the hands of an angry God? I mean, are we, you know, is everything predestined? I mean, does the church even matter? Like, how do you read the Bible? It says some crazy things about stoning disobedient children and stuff like that. I mean, how do you do that? And so for me, it was very pressing. So I kind of wanted to get to the bottom of that first. And when people come to you for help, is it usually one specific area and then you end up addressing more than just that one? Yeah, well, that's a great question is um, I learned from one of my mentors that the place, the space between what you're offering and what people are looking for is called work. You know, so whenever, you know, people, whatever they're doing, you know, a lot of times people have health issues like that weight, you know, even though it's not the most exciting thing, I definitely have helped, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people get to their ideal weight. I've trained thousands of people on how to train people on how to get their ideal weight. So I'm very familiar with it. You know, for myself, that was why I originally got involved with the company that I was with. You know, I still am for 15 years. It was about weight loss. You know, a lady I met in Dallas, Texas in January, 2005, and she was just looking so radiant and her skin was clear and she was smiling. And, and I was just like, what the heck is that woman on? You know, <laughs> and I was like in this room of exhausted, overwhelmed, pudgy people, there's this beaming, radiant woman. And I just went up to her and I was like, oh my gosh, well, what's your deal? You know, why are you smiling? Um, and then, you know, and then she told me about what she was doing. And then she said, oh, and you know, I dropped, you know, seven pounds and 11 inches in, in nine days. And I was like, huh? What'd you say? You know? Um, so even though it's not the most exciting thing for me, um, weight loss is a big thing. I help people that that tends to be the gateway into it. But then there's like a whole emotional thing around eating and, you know, uh, and also there's just this unconscious thing that people do. They don't even realize what they're doing or why they're doing it. Like, why are you eating ice cream at night before you go to bed? It, you know, it makes you, you don't even feel good. You know, what are you doing? And then it, tends to be like what we're doing with food tends to be how we're doing a lot of things in our lives. You know, like as one, a different mentor said to me, you know, how you do one thing is how you do everything, you know? So just, we can look at the food, we can look at what you're doing with what you say you want, and then what you're actually doing to create the results you're getting in your life, you know, and kind of break it down like that. Last month, I turned the ripe young age of 60. Mm. And my the last six or eight months, my body has started talking to me a little bit on foods. And so I've been playing around with different foods to figure out, you know, what they do. And obviously trying to get away from as much of the junk food as I can. Mm -hmm. And what I've learned just kind of looking at how I ate and when I ate and what I ate was my biggest problem right now is just when I eat too fast. I get more issues than almost what I eat. And I had, would have never thought about that. And one day I was just, I guess I was wolfing down to dinner and my wife looked at me and went, really? <laughs> and that's what I found out. So I started looking at stuff that way, but just, I was just shoveling everything down in about eight seconds. And I know why, that is not healthy. Do you know why you were doing that? Uh, I don't know. I don't know if I've always done that. I guess I have, but uh, yeah. So I've tried to two bites, put the fork down you know, chew it real good and swallow. And it's made a difference. I feel much better when I finish eating a meal. And uh, so just little things like that. But I figured 60, I better start looking at some things so I can, you know, the grandkid live a lot longer, things like that. But, uh, and then also in moderation, it's amazing when you don't eat past where you need to, <laughs> how much better you feel. Absolutely. And slowing down will help with that. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, so, well, I just commend you on, you know, paying attention to mm -hmm. your body because that's a big thing is people don't really listen to their heart. They don't really listen to their body. They don't really listen to other people. They're, we're, we tend to, um, our society has a, you know, I think a cancer of busyness, you know, of yeah. course that's all been blown up by COVID or whatever, but even then it's just, 
people are, you know, wanting this, this, if you say, you know, I'm not actually overwhelmed, like people ask me to do things I'm like, oh, I'm sure you're super, super busy and you can't do this. I'm like, well, I mean, I can do whatever I want. I can't necessarily do it today, but I can, I have control over my schedule, you know, and if it's something that is aligned with what I want to do in the world, then, you know, I could probably make it happen. Um, so, and then people are like, you know, cause they're just used to people being, oh my God, I'm so busy. I'm so overwhelmed. I just can't possibly take another thing on and whatever, you know? And I'm like, what if it wasn't like that? What if you were just doing the things that you really wanted to do? Or at least if it's something that isn't like your favorite thing, you know why you're doing it. So it's in alignment with what you're doing, you know? And yep. so there's not that resistance and that disconnect, like where people are saying, oh, I, I have to do this. Yes. You know, this is yeah. happening to me. I have to do this. It's like, do you have to do, like, what would happen if you didn't do that? Or like, if it's something that you really don't like to do, what if we just looked at your life and saw how maybe you could just not have to do that? You know, maybe you can delegate that. Maybe you can renegotiate your agreements around that. You know, maybe you can teach people to have different expectations of you. Um, you know, like there's a one client, I think I'm going to sign him tomorrow, but you know, a veterinarian been working you know six days a week for 25 years you know every third weekend off or whatever and i'm like first of all who would want to do that but secondly he doesn't want to do that you know and i'm like well what if you just didn't have to do that like what i don't know what that would look like but what what if you didn't you know and um so i um so i think part of it is to help people i mean it kind of sounds cliche but to help people dream again like to help yeah. people act think like if you could choose what would you like to do? And um, that is such a big stretch because people have just kind of given away their power. They've given away authority. They're, they're just, you know, reacting, um, treading water. You know, um, treading water is a good image because many years ago, I guess it was about 16 years ago or something, I still had two jobs. I had two little kids and I had started a business and we were flipping the house we lived in. Okay. <laughs> So this is this is a lot okay and i remember i was just like i was with my husband i was at the time he he went on he passed away but at the time and i was like i don't know what the hell i was thinking. how did i get myself <laughs> into this this is not reasonable you know i'm gonna lose my crap and um and he was like shell you're not going for a swim you're swimming across a river you just keep swimming you know and i was like oh yeah you know it's temporary like human beings are capable. If you just even look at brain chemistry or the way our bodies are about adrenaline and cortisol and all these things, you know, that we're designed to be able to go with less sleep, you know, do things, push through. We are designed to do that uh, for a short period of time. You know, we don't want to stay in that place. Um, and so when I help people think about it differently, like, hey, first of all, this is a choice I'm making. The reason why I'm doing this is because I'm creating this. I'm, you know, on my way to the other side. The other side, I only have to work one job or I'm going to be able to hire an employee, you know, or something. Um, and for me, actually, it ties in with BNI because my first goal when I started my business was to be able to have a significant, you know, the income that was every single week that I could pay a nanny who would do my laundry, clean my house on Thursdays so I could go to Full City BNI. There you go. I like and that. And I achieved it. Yeah. But that's called a plan, isn't it? It is. <laughs> and then I was like, okay, this is worth it. Why am I on the phone making calls to California at, you know, 1130 at night? Um, and that's because the time zones work like that. And that's when I can make phone calls and, um, you know, and it was worth it, you know, because um, I got what I wanted, you know. We are here with Michelle Castle of Prosperity Partner. Michelle is also a member of RD27. Bull City business leaders, they're the big bad daddy of Triangle B&I. They're the biggest, have been the biggest for a long, long time. They bring in the most money, pass the most referrals. <laughs> There's a reason why they're always that good. So if you're in the Durham area uh, and want to meet some really, really focused individuals that are there helping each other, please check out their chapter. Today's show is brought to you by Oak City Tech. One of the things you need, folks, is social media help. We think it'll be a lot of fun posting every day and posting twice a day, but it can be a hassle and a grind on you. So you need professionals like the folks at Oak, Oak City Tech to help you. Please go to oakcitytech.com. Tell them what you're looking for. I know they'll be able to help you. All right, Michelle, in the small business world, we are always looking for balance in work and life. 
when we first start a business, we'll answer any phone call. <laughs> we'll take any client because we have rent to pay. And then yeah. kids come along and then we realize, hey, what if I told all my customers that I, I'm not open on Saturday? Exactly. I'm only open Monday through Friday. And that might solve some problems. I know with some small business owners, like we have to be open all the time. And no, if you just teach people when you're open, they'll still come find you if they really want to do business with you. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Teaching people, and this goes in business, but also in life, you know, teaching people how to treat us and how we want to be treated. Um, I think setting up agreements around your workflow is really good too. Like some of the clients I've had, um, I was doing some, I did two 90 day contracts in a fortune 500 company that was uh, taking over a software company. And, um, and so I, I worked, I looked at their, their workflow of their top people and helped them kind of duplicate that because they couldn't really just throw spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks anymore. They had to be all grown up and have systems and things. So I, I looked at, you know, the people that were the most successful and, you know, I helped them do things, just little things like they would have their email pop up on their desk, like all the time. So they would just be shifting back and forth all the time. And, you know, I'm like, no, you know, I mean, now it there, and as I understood it in their, in their uh, work style, it was expected that they would respond very, you know, in a timely manner to email. So what I had them do was, you know, whenever they were setting their appointments or whatever, just give themselves at the top of the hour, you know, seven minutes to respond to emails that had come through during that hour. And, um, you know, leaving their, their voicemail to say, you know, I'll return your call, your call by the end of business today or something like that. And then so, you know, booking the time so they were done with appointments at 4.30, so they would have 30 minutes to return calls, you know, um, and just kind of grouping things in their life. And then, because transitions are, you know, take up a lot of time. So if you can group things together, um, then you actually create more time to do other things. And that's a way you can really improve your productivity. Yeah, is and most emails aren't emergencies. Even when the person send it that says, oh my God, I gotta have it right now. It generally doesn't mean right now, but we, a lot of us feel that, oh, I, I better return this. And that's not always the case. And email is such a huge waste of time. But you're right. It's the transition part that kills us. Absolutely. And, and the thing is too, Mike, it's like realtors. Okay. If you're going to be a realtor and you're going to sit here and say, well, I'm sorry, I only work this hour and that hour, or whatever. Good luck. Because <laughs> realtors, it's somebody, you know, they see it's very competitive. They see a house, they're right by there. They want someone to call them back. So you know, if you're really don't want that kind of lifestyle, I would suggest, you know, building a team, you know, and also maybe not being a realtor because it's just like that, you know, like if you're going to be a, you know, an OB doctor, you know, you're going to work nights because women have babies at <laughs> night time, you know, it just don't do that. You know, if you don't want to do that. Um, but, in, and in particular, there's, there are different expectations of different fields. And so like for that company, they had, they were working on so many projects in the company that they really needed to respond to each other in a timely manner because there was a project and they didn't want to move on until they got like a buy-in or whatever. So then it's good to know, okay, so then we're going to have a folder. Those are the ones you're going to return, like, you know, on the, maybe on the half hour, but the other stuff, you know, and tell your clients or it just says in the bottom of your email, I thank you for, you know, your email and I will be responding, you know, between appointments or something so that they get a response. You know, so it, it's all just in life, really, is just teaching people how to treat us. Yep. Agreed. Do you remember your first client? Well, my first client was me, for sure. All right. Your uh, first paid client. First paid client. <laughs> That's a good. Um, I remember uh, an entrepreneur. I'm still, she actually still does work with me sometimes. Um, and she, I gave a talk. And... Um, she came up to me afterward and she said, oh, so you can help me lose my baby weight? And I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't even know you had a baby. She's like, oh, I, I don't. I've just had this weight since I was a baby. You know? <laughs> Ooh, I'm going to use that one. I know I'm yeah. only 60, but I'm going to use that one one day. <laughs> exactly. So I remember that, you know, that was a memorable conversation. We went on to have a really good, uh, really good working relationship and, and changed a lot of lives. She was very, she's very knowledgeable. She was a, um, a PhD in microbiology and immunology doing cancer research. And then it, it hit her that why are we sitting here looking at how to cure cancer? Because every day in the lab, we make cancer. 
When we want to have cancerous cells, we know how to give cells cancer. We do it all the time. And it just, and she just couldn't, it's like one of those thoughts that you just, it's like an earworm. Like she could not get that thought out of her head. And so she ended up, she had so much integrity. She ended up leaving, leaving cancer research and going to massage school and becoming a massage therapist and working with people on holistic health. Wow. Um, yeah. Because, it, you know, every single day, you know, you get to make it acidic, give them sugar, deprive them of oxygen and voila and mm -hmm. micronutrients, put some free radicals in there and ta-da, you've got cancer. So it's like, why don't we just stop doing that to people? Wow. I've never heard of it that way. Yeah. I know it blew me away. Yeah. yeah. And I, didn't, I, didn't, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't have even known that at all unless she told me that, you know? Yeah. When did you know that this business, this prosperity partner and this path was going to work out? Well, um, what I do now with the coaching is, um, is much bigger than when I started out in my business. When I started out my business, I, um, I was, I joined a network marketing company and, um, and I, you know, didn't, I'm, I'm, I love to have fun but I also am very analytical. So I did so much research on, you know, the industry, that company, products, manufacturing, blah, blah, blah. I mean, all the stuff, talked to so many different people that were doing it and everything like that. And I um, just got really informed about it. And so when I started with that company, I was completely committed because I had gotten all of my questions answered. And I knew that I was being mentored by people that had actually created results they were not given some backdoor deal uh you know an existing team blah 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 sign in but like they just ground it out and they they were going to help me do that and um and that was really valuable because i feel like in life if you find someone that has what you want you know and if you're willing to be coachable and i'm not saying like some cult thing like do whatever they say for the rest of your life i'm just saying commit to 90 days you know commit to 60 days commit to something like a lot of people have opinions about everything. And I'm like, well, how about you just try it first? Then when you've mastered this, you can tweak it. You know, like with a recipe, I help people with cooking. I love to cook, you know, and, um, and you know, when you get a recipe, don't, you don't just start off by changing around. You know, you get the recipe, do it exactly how it is. And then, you know, oh, I want it to be a little lighter. I wonder what it would be like with nuts in it, something, something. Then you mess with it, you know? So I think being coachable, and, and that, that, the important thing about that, of how you get to that relationship of trust is that you look for someone that has created what you want. So and, what's your, what's your go-to meal? Oh, I, I drink my shakes a lot, but, um, oh, well, if I see, what am I known for? Yes. Um, is my curry chicken, my Jamaican, Jamaican curry chicken Ooh. is really outstanding. Yeah. Okay. And that's my, I learned it from my grandmother, you know, and it's so talking about how you think about stuff. Cause I remember, you know, some people, they are very obsessive about the cleanliness of their house. I fortunately am not one of those people, but <laughs> I understand there are people like that. No, I, I do, I do actually keep a pretty clean house, but whenever I, I see, you know, onion like casings and stuff or like garlic casings, like on the floor or something, or, you know, like maybe a couple of grains of rice or something, I've just learned to be really grateful when I see that, because I think about how many kids don't have that. They just eat out of fast food. They send out or something, you know, is somebody going to actually take the time to like chop garlic, cut up onions. Um, and it makes me also think of my grandmother because my grandmother was always cooking in the house and we always had that little bits of stuff on the floor, you know, carrot tops or whatever. And then at nighttime she would sweep them and eat her banana and have her milk of magnesia before she went to bed, but she would sweep up all the little bits, you know? So I think of my grandmother when I do that. Um, I did go to this um, training uh, when I was working for the church and um, this guy was, so he said that the church is, um, that your home is the domestic church, right? And so, and he said the incense of the domestic church is garlic and onions. So he had everyone commit to A, not text while driving, Good. and B, at least once a week, cut up onions and garlic and put it in olive oil in the pan. And he didn't care what you did with it after that, but he wanted your kids to smell that. You know, he wanted yep. your spouse to come home and, and feel that and just get that sense of like coziness and, you know, nourishing stuff. Um, and I, I love that, you know, I think we've, 
moved away from that. People are trying to move towards that with the stuff that comes in a box that's already measured and stuff. I haven't done that, but it seems like a pretty good idea. I don't know how it works out in terms of cost and stuff, but I do think that people, you know, they, they spend too much money on eating out. It's like, it's going to make me sick, broke, and fat. Yep. Maybe I'm not going to do that like a whole bunch, you know? It should be a treat. Yeah. <clears throat> right? exactly. We do it once a week. We do yeah. it once a week. Yeah. And, you make it and it is special. Yeah. It is special. All right. So you are the, I love when we have firsts on the show and you are the first person with Chinese and Jamaican heritage. Indeed. I'm a little of this and that. It's true. Uh, now, two wonderfully creative, devout uh, cultures. But tell me how good those parties were and the food and the family reunions and everything. Well, it's interesting because uh, Chinese, Chinese people, they don't um, drink a lot. Uh, generally speaking, they're, they get very red in the face and kind of don't hold their alcohol well. But Jamaicans <laughs> have a very good time. Um, and so the Chinese, you know, yeah. So food was always really important, you know, um, food. And I mean, I remember, so what, what happened is in 1976, there was a communist revolution in Jamaica. He was, he was um, Michael Manley was elected democratically and then decided that he was going to just take after his friend Fidel and do what Fidel had done in Cuba. So anyone, and it became very, very violent. Like what was happening last summer in some of those cities, it was all over the country. Like there was nowhere to go that was safe. And my parents had two little girls, you know, and they were like, we can't, we can't, you know, this is not gonna work. And so my dad's British. So we were able to um, come to the United States um, and they bought a business here and basically started over. But most of my family, they couldn't come to America, so they emigrated to um, uh, Toronto. And I still have a lot of relatives in Toronto. There's actually a huge Chinese Jamaican uh, community in Toronto, if you didn't know that. All right, hang on a sec then. I, I got the Chinese and the Jamaican, and now your, your dad's British? Yeah. All right, I mean, so I, your mom is Chinese. Yeah, where, does the, where does the Jamaican side come from? Well, um, we are, I'm third generation Jamaican born. I mean, I don't know how many generations you have to live in a country to be from there, but okay. third generation Jamaican born. My mother was born there. My grandmother was born there. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I imagine you learned uh, food early on. Well, it was right? always, yeah. Yeah. That was good. Um, did you learn, uh, are you fluent in Chinese? I am not at all. Okay. And even if I was, the thing is that my family, um, you know, they fled in communist, communist, take over in, in my grandfather did in China also. And so um, he actually lost a child there and everything. So he became an, um, an indentured servant to get out of China. And that, I don't even know this. I don't even think he knew that he was going to Jamaica. They were just like, okay, we're going over here. I, I don't know. You know, they've wow. been, he's been dead for a long time, but um, yeah, it was, um, it's, it's interesting how that is because Chinese, Chinese people do not talk about emotions at all. Like it, it's like neither did the British. So I just did not grow up in a very emotional household at all. I mean, there were many redeeming qualities, but one of them was not emotional intelligence at all. You know, it was all very like, this is how it should be. And everything's very principled and, you know, honorable and organized and stuff like that. It, then but, how did your parents meet? Um, oh, that's just your, you know, run of the mill thing where, you know, my mom, um, so little church history. So Vatican II happened and then people realized that they did not have to basically say a rosary to get into heaven. And, you know, we're not afraid of eternal damnation at any moment. They learned about grace in a different way. And so my mom, who was in the convent, she was like, oh, seriously? Okay, well, you know, then peace out. So she got <laughs> excused from being a nun um, after 11 years and she left the convent and then she met my dad and uh, a, a few months later, he was actually dating her friend. And then they got married uh, six months later. And you have a sister. I do. Do both of you carry, how much of the Chinese and Jamaican and British uh, just physical features? Or do you guys look alike? Um, yeah, I, I think we look alike. I, I look the least Asian. And my sister looks, you know, her hair's darker and straighter. Um, Interesting. And then my brother, he looks the most Asian of all of us. And I don't, I don't know why that is. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's interesting when, my, when we get together with my family, which is like all over the United States too, in, in addition to Toronto, and it just kind of goes down. Like 
my oldest uncle, he, he had, he had an arranged marriage and, um, you know, and they're super Chinese. They don't even really speak very much English. Um, and their kids, so their kids look very, very Chinese because they're like hundred percent Chinese and they're, you know, doctors and stuff like that. And then, um, depending on who married who, then some of them look less Asian, you know, and more Asian and some of them are in Ohio and Kentucky, then we have somebody that converted to Mormon. So they've got people in Utah. And so but we all became, you know, um, we love America. You know, we're just this, a family that fled. And when I did some, some family tree stuff, like I couldn't believe it that, you know, me, myself, we left, you know, came here. And then um, my grandfather left there, you know, China for the same, basically, fleeing tyranny, you know, and then from what I could tell, although I haven't verified this, I'm going to, if I can ever get to Europe again with this pandemic, but I'd like to hear about how we came to England with the last name Abraham. And, um, you know, I think that in our, I think that we might've been fleeing tyranny in um, Eastern Europe and, you know, went to um, England and we're like, oh yeah, we're Anglican. Uh Uh-huh. And people would say, Michelle, Abraham, are you Jewish? And I'm like, no, we're not Jewish. We're Catholic. And they're like, I don't know, man. <laughs> I think, very nice, I, I think we all have sprinkles of a few things around that we, the 23 and me may never show us or tell us. Yeah. Now, I don't do that stuff, but uh, other relatives of mine do it. So I get a little bit of this and that. Do you have dual citizenship? I am actually imminently awaiting to get dual citizenship. I'm not an American citizen. I've been a permanent resident alien since 1977. Really? Yep. And I started my uh, citizenship application in May 2020, and I'm still waiting. All right. Well, uh, you need help on the task. Don't ask any uh, any any of us folks or many of us folks born in the U.S. because I don't think we could pass that test now. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a little concerned about it. I will see. I mean, I, I figure it's got to be doable. It's got to be easier than Duke, right? So. Uh, I would think so, yes. And by the way, congratulations on getting an MBA from Duke. Well, uh, it's an MBA, but yeah. Or Master of Theology. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, are your, ki- your kids are American citizens, though, right? Are. Yep. Okay. What have they learned from you with your coaching and the way you work with folks, you know, physically, emotionally, spiritually, financially, what have they, what kind of area, which of those areas are they drawn to? Well, they, I think one thing is that they all really think about what they're doing. You know, they're, they're sort of naturally um, a little bit skeptical about things and just, or, you know, or maybe just not super attached to like, oh, this is me. And, you know, I, you know, my personality is me and my roles that people put on me and expectations are like everything. You know, I think they see me, they see me help people really change. And so if they don't like something, at least even if they get overwhelmed or stressed out, they kind of in the back of their mind, they know, like, I could probably just make a different choice. Like my, my son, who's actually my oldest one, who's on the spectrum. And, you know, he was super overwhelmed, uh, last semester or not the semester before and with COVID and all that. And UNCW not, did not do a very good job handling that stuff. It, he had very little support and he was totally overwhelmed. And I said to him, you know, Trey, how about you just quit? You know, I mean, we could just quit. I mean, you could just quit and then you could just do something else or start over again you know, and he's like, mom, stop saying that. And I'm like, but literally you can, you know, like you always have choices. I'm not going to love you less. You're not going to be like a less of a human being. If you take off a semester, you know, or you withdraw, it's like, you know, I think people make a really big deal out of these certain things that people have to do at a certain time and being in youth ministry and stuff. I've seen people want to go to UNC Chapel Hill. That is very hard to get into UNC Chapel Hill. If you go to freaking anywhere in the state for a semester or two, you can go there. Mm. You know, I mean, I know so many people, they got the thing on the walls as UNC Chapel Hill. They didn't get in there. They didn't like, you know, invent a cure to cancer before they were 18 to get in there, you know? And so there's just a lot of things. Like we put a lot of pressure on ourselves because we think what everybody else is doing, you know, that it looks so good and it's so organized and whatever. And it's like, life is messy. And, you know, you can always make a change. You can always just think about it differently, 
Um, and if you don't know what change you want to do, then, you know, find someone who has what you want and go talk to them about it. You know, I think that's the value of what you're doing here. It's like the stories are everything. And it's not just because it's entertaining. Like people legitimately learn stuff. Like don't do this. Okay. Yeah. Do do this, you know, um, like me. I would not recommend getting an $80,000 philosophy degree. It's just not a good financial investment. I, I would not suggest that people do that. But, you know, if you have spiritual questions that are keeping you up at night, then I suggest that you do take a look at, a look at them. Because from the people I've talked to, a lot of people I know that are depressed, there's actually a, I'm going to say, wrong belief about God that is actually at the core of, of why they're depressed. Because they think that God did these things to them you know, of course you're going to get mad at somebody that did this super messed up thing. You know, I mean, I lost my husband when I had a two, five year and seven year old, you know, when I was like basically in ministry. I mean, it's just like, how does this even, you know? Um, and so if you, and I was courageous to look at those questions, you know, I, I had done that. So I was already in the habit. I had a relationship with my creator so that I could say, I don't like that. Or what are you thinking? Or why, why, or something not demanding, like I have to know now, but like, at least I can, say that i don't have to pretend like everything's fine you know when, yeah. um, and when i get to certain moments whether things are just overwhelming or there's just a lot on the plate i'm a big fan of just getting a piece of paper out and start writing things down whether it's a just left side right side or keep or go what it, yeah. you know pros and cons whatever are you yeah. are you a fan of something like that oh absolutely in fact that that's one of the like moments of like a turning point in my own life was I was graduating from Boston University with philosophy. I didn't know what I was doing because like, what do you do with a philosophy degree? And, um, and I, you know, I was riding on the T the at night and I saw the chapel and I'd been there for four years. I just never even noticed the chapel and it was really well illuminated. And I, you know, I was really kind of like doing this soul searching, like, what am I doing next? I don't know, you know? And, um, and so I went in the chapel and I said, basically what you're talking about. I just kind of made a, a column on one side about how I was feeling, you know, and then on the other side, I wrote down how I wanted to feel, you know, and then I noticed that there were some lights on in the basement, went down there and um, I saw a door open and I just knocked on it and said, Hey, do you mind, if we, you know, do you have a second to talk to me? And it turned out it was the Dean of the chapel. Like if I'd wanted an appointment with the guy, I, I probably couldn't have <laughs> For like 18 months. He has 15 minutes, you know, but I just went in there yeah. and, um, and he, and he was so pastoral, you know, um, with me. And he said, Michelle, these are really wonderful questions that you're asking, you know, and this is a very sacred place you're at in your life. And, um, you know, there's a place where people are asking these questions all the time. And it's, uh, the church and divinity school. People are, you know, you, you will be with people that are thinking about these things now, but also you'll be studying these people for the last, you know, 4,000 years that have been talking about these things. And I was like, oh, okay. So that was how I decided to go to divinity school. Cause I was like, what else am I going to do? That sounds like a good idea. Sure. <laughs> so then I ended up with a, you know, $30,000 master's degree where you're like, again, what am I going to do with this? What am I going to do with this? I like the clarity when looking at the sheet of paper and then you can start doodling. You can change, you can tweak it you can circle it you can scratch through it you can draw a line from that word to another word to start thinking oh those two might go together i just i've always been a big fan of just writing it down because then you can look at it in the analogy i give people it's like a swatch when you're thinking about repainting your house mm -hmm. and you just put it up on the wall and you walk by at eight in the morning and look at it how does the light look then you yeah. walk by at four in the afternoon, look at it. How does the light look? You just keep looking at it and eventually you're going to go, oh, that's it. Or yeah. nope, let's move on to another. Yeah, I love that. I mean, I, I think it that reminds me of something that is a really great um, tool that I've learned is like about visualizing. So, um, and it helps with, and a lot of people have anxiety now. I think it just went up, like there's more people suffering from anxiety than depression. And so one of the ways um, that you can prepare yourself for a situation that you might have anxiety about is to just kind of visualize specifically what is it going to be like. So let's say I'm coming on here. I'm like, okay, so I'm going to get on with Mike. I don't, I don't know if it's going to be Zoom or it's going to be on a call, but then he's going to ask me questions, you know, and then I'm going to, you know, I'll have a, a notebook with me in case I, you know, want to write something down and just kind of visualize exactly how it's going to be and visualize, you know, and I said that to you before we started, we're going to have fun. 
You know, I was setting the intention that we're going to have fun, you know, and, and setting the intention, like, it's going to be great. I'm not, it's not going to be perfect, but we're going to have a good time. And we're, you know, I'm going to be, you know, authentic and vulnerable and, you know, you're going to be good at what you do and we'll just have fun and maybe somebody will learn something and probably it'll be me and you, you know? Um, <laughs> but I think, you know, what do we want? You know, yeah. what's my intention for this and kind of visualizing how it could go. But there is a book called, um, you may have read it. Um, it's very old school language. It's actually kind of funny, but um, the Dale Carnegie book, how to stop worrying and start living. Um, right. It's a really good book. And basically it just says like, just imagine the worst case scenario. Like, so for this, it'd be like, okay, you know, I totally screwed up. I cursed and dropped the F bomb or whatever. You said something I totally offended, like, you know, political incorrectness or I don't know, whatever it was. And nobody ever wants to talk to me again. Like, okay, I can live through that. Like, okay, well then after that, it's fine. If you imagine the worst case scenario and you can live with it, then you don't really have to worry about being in fear, you know? I agree. My brother has been a serial small business owner since about 1995. And when he looks at buying a business or starting one, that's the very first question he asked himself. If all of this went wrong tomorrow, what's the worst that would happen to me? Yeah. And it's a wonderful place to start. I don't, my mind doesn't go there, but it has over the years as I've worked with him, we start, we've had a couple businesses together, but it's a wonderful place to start, to start and kind of takes a pressure off when you go, oh, that's it. Oh, okay. I can yeah. live with that. Yeah. Like if you just bombed it or, yeah. you know, somebody just whatever. And then you're like, okay, that would be awkward. I wouldn't like it. In fact, one time I was doing, I'm also a real estate investor and I was doing the biggest flip I've ever done on a house. And then, um, uh, my husband at the time lost his job and da, 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 so whatever, a bunch of stuff happened. And so by basically my bills were doubled and my income was in half and <laughs> it was just staying that way for months. And it was just really not what I wanted uh, to be happening. And, um, and I kept on feeling like, Oh, this is what it feels like before I freak out. I don't know what the freaking out is going to look like, but this is what it would feel like before I freaked out. And um, then I had this dream. And in the dream, I lost everything. I lost all my real estate. You know, my network marketing company went out of business. You know, I lost my house, everything, everything. And in my dream, I just got my kids in the car and drove to my mom's house and started over, you know, and got a job waiting on tables, just like I had at the beginning of my, you know, career. And when I woke up, I was like, well, you know, it's just money. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it just gave me this total peace, you know? Good. Are there Chinese and Jamaican names for grandma and grandfather? Yeah. Well, they don't have a Chinese. Yeah. They, my, they call my mom Japo, which is um, maternal grandmother. Oh, and then, cool. Yeah. And then they call my late husband's parents um, Bachi and Jaji, which is Yiddish, which is Polish, whatever. I don't know. Okay. Very yeah. cool. I like mm -hmm. the different names. Love the heritage connection and to carry that through. Uh, but that I, I that's again, love these stories of stuff I've never lived. Uh, those are the stories that intrigue me the most. But Michelle, uh, thanks for coming on today. Had a blast. Uh, some good knowledge for folks. We've been putting your phone number up there. So if you want to get in touch with Michelle uh, to answer any questions, I know she'll be able to help you. We've been putting that up there. And also... Great. The email is michelle at prosperitypartner.com. That's Michelle with one L. How many times in your life have you had to spell it that way to people? Every single time, yeah. <laughs> Did your mom and dad ever tell you why they didn't put the second L in there? I was on some weird French kick. And I was like, mom, am I French? No, because my middle name's Fleur, which is flower. Yeah. And I'm like, why? Like, I just like French. I'm like, okay. So, Michelle Fleur. I like yeah. that. I'll have to remember that next time when we're together. I'm like, so the flower, what do you think? <laughs> yeah. I like, like that. I like that. So uh, anyway, thanks for coming on today. Good luck with everything. And we will see everybody next time on Triangle B&I. Thanks for having me, Mike. Appreciate it. tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. If you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archives section at nissancommunications.com. 
Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by StreamingGear.com, Carolina Apparel, and DeltaForce.net.